Uh, good. So thanks for the invitation again to be part of this course and the work, this workshop. I only always enjoy talking a little bit about the uh, journey that we did to develop and uh, design these uh, very nice neural probes. Um, so yeah, just to give you a very brief introduction to IMEC, uh, because we don't have much time, so I will keep it very brief. Uh, so IMEC is a, a nanotechnology uh, research center that has headquarters in Belgium, um, but there are other uh, offices uh, all around the world, but the main technical uh, two offices are in Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, we have uh, more than 400, uh, uh, 4,500 international uh, employees that uh, covers uh, not only researchers, but also people that work in our clean rooms. So here in this uh, slide, you can see uh, a picture of IMEC facilities. Um, but it's very clear that uh, one of the uh, characteristics of IMEC is that we have a, uh, a very good clean room where we can do a, a, many uh, developments and research on materials on semiconductors uh, and that's why uh, the development of neuropixels uh, could happen uh, at IMEC. Um, so the development of neuropixels was motivated for this need to scale current uh, neural recording technologies and of course, CMOS uh, was a very good candidate to help with this scaling because uh, you can develop very small circuits and high performance circuits in very small areas. So the objective of this upscaling was to try to uh, provide you uh, as neuroscientists with a better tool that can record many more neurons in a very compact and user friendly and also uh, at low cost. Um, so I have this um, diagram to show more or less what NeuroPixels does. So uh, in the chunk of the probe, we have an array of electrodes uh, that are actively selected. So under each electrode, we have some electronics that allow the selection of a uh, pixels and group of pixels by using a uh, local memory that gets programmed through a digital interface. Uh, then in the base of the probes, you see here, uh, there is uh, an array of electronic channels uh, that are um, able to record these neural signals with very low noise. Uh, they are also able to filter them and convert it to digital domain. So basically we have an analog input with very small uh, input range, and we convert this uh, with low noise into a digital output. Uh, so here in this cartoon, I represent this. Uh, so what happens inside the probe is that the spikes are recorded in very small signals and they travel along the shank. In the base, uh, the first step is a low noise amplification uh, where uh, the most important goal here is to try to bring the signal a little bit larger so that they can be uh, processed by the subsequent, uh, subsequent blocks. And this amplification is uh, done at very low noise. So we do, uh, in NeuroPixels 1, we do uh, filtering to uh, split the signals into AP and LFP. And uh, we also apply um, independent amplifications for these two signals. As, as you know, the amplitude ranges of these two signals are different. So what we want to do is to amplify them more or less to the same level so that the ATC can process it with a, a lower uh, resolution or number of bits. So that's happening in the ATC. So the output is then digital. So that is done then uh, for uh, 384 parallel channels that we have in the probe. Uh, so I will uh, very briefly mention uh, what's uh, the architecture of this probe. Uh, so here you have some dimensions, we saw some pictures. So as I described in my previous slides, what we have in the pixels is just a switch and a local memory or a chief register. And this get connected then in the base to our uh, low noise amplification that provides a gain of 50. Uh, and then some filters and programmable gain amplifiers for both the AP and LFP channels. 
And these channels get multiplexed and uh, processed by a 10-bit ATC. So the specifications are here. So one of the main goals of the project, uh, or, or let's call it the main challenges, were to achieve the low noise uh, because we want to do very small devices. Uh, normally, uh, achieving low noise at the same time is quite challenging. Um, and also to achieve the level of resolution and, and filtering that we want to do. We have a, a more detailed uh, paper on the electronics for the people that is interested. So you can see all the details of how the circuits inside are implemented. Um, here you have some uh, details of the, yeah, what we call the dual bane the dual band recording channel. Uh, so basically what we do here with this dual band is to separate the AP signals from 300 Hertz to 10K. So this filter is uh, done on chip. It's a first order filter. So uh, for the people that need better uh, filtering, it's better to apply uh, additional filtering um, outside uh, of the chip in, in, in the digital domain. And the, lo the lo uh, local field potential uh, filter is from 0 0.5 hertz up to one kilohertz. And here the sampling rate is a little bit lower for the LFP channel. Uh, to give you some details on what we did in 2.0, so, 2 so, uh, so uh, the goal of 2.0 was uh, to be able to reduce the area significantly. Um, but at the same time, keeping a very similar electrical performance and also the same number of channels. Uh, the so the only way to achieve this was um, to simplify the recording channel a lot. So in that case, we had to compromise our band splitting because all the filters require significant area. Uh, we also uh, give up on the programmable gain amplifiers. And so uh, we did a full band neuron, uh, readout uh, channel that has a fixed gain. I think in the final version of 2.0, this gain will be 100. Uh, but know, here we have a 12-bit ATC. And uh, this will record neurons, both APs and LFP uh, at the same so time uh, using the same so gain and uh, uh, the same ATC. Uh, new kinds of recordings. So uh, the for the electron selectivity, uh, uh, we have a lot of flexibility. Or so or since we have many more pixels than and channels, and uh, the user will have to select the through the software or the GUI uh, some uh, groups um, of pixels that they want to record at the same time. Uh, they can uh, select consecutive pixels uh, or distribute small groups along the whole shank or also do single pixel selection fully distributed. So that's the freedom that uh, is provided to the user. And uh, this is enabled then through the software. For the references, uh, we have several options in 2.0. Uh, we have a, a large tip uh, electrode that can be used as a reference. We also have the possibility to connect an external electrode, a large one. Or we have also the possibility to select some small uh, recording pixels as references. Uh, each channel can select which of these uh, different options uh, uh, as a reference. Uh, so each channel can independently have a reference. Uh, and normally, I think for most of the use cases, uh, uh, a single reference is used, but it must be some experiments where having different references can be interesting. Um, so I also wanted to very briefly explain the difference between reference and grounded. Normally during these workshops, um, this is probably the most uh, popular information that people would like, would like to know. Uh, so I have very briefly uh, put some slides just to explain this. Uh, so the, in the case of a ground, a ground represents our zero volt uh, voltage uh, reference, let's call it like that, uh, is just to establish our uh, middle input range. Uh, so when we talk about uh, grounding, it's just uh, this ground is going to determine what is, what is our input swing at the input of the amplifier and what is our saturation range. Uh, so if you have an, an animal that is floating, uh, so you don't have a reference, uh, a ground electrode connected, what will happen is that the signal that we are recording is not well referenced to the ground of the chip. 
So they are not, uh, let's say, talking in the same reference level. So it could be that the signal will be in the saturation range uh, and you won't be able to record it with our amplifier. So having uh, the ground connected, it will make sure that uh, the signal that we record is with, within this uh, input range. Uh, when we talk about reference, uh, that's something else. So your reference is basically your negative input of the amplifier. So it's the signal uh, against which you will do your differential amplification. Uh, so having a reference electrode uh, connected uh, to in the same brain region, uh, um, yeah, or that depends on, on, on your experiment. It will allow to cancel uh, your common uh, noise or interferences or movement artifacts. So that's uh, the main role of the reference. Uh, so when you have a differential amplification, you will be able to record then uh, or to cancel this common mode uh, noise. But if you have a single ended, single ended means that you connect your negative uh, reference or your negative input to ground. Uh, what you will have is that you will amplify all the common mode noise as well. So the, the best practice for referencing is always to use a reference that is uh, not grounded. Uh, yeah, and here I'm also showing some possible uh, grounding schemes uh, from the electronic point of view. Uh, so this is a differential amplification with an external reference electrode. So in the probe, you have two uh, soldering pads uh, where you can connect one is an external reference, the other is a ground. Um, uh, an issue here is that you will require two external electrodes, uh, but you will have good common modes cancellation if you don't connect these two uh, uh, signals together. Uh, you can have a single-ended operation where you connect both uh, ground and reference together. So uh, in this case, you only need uh, one external reference but you will have poor cancellation of common mode noise. This is because of the construction of the electronics inside the probe. And um, I think a, a popular case is when you use differential operation with internal reference. In this case, you only need one wire, but you also have the um, cancellation because the electrode is internally in the brain. So I think this is probably one of the best choices uh, to achieve a common mode cancellation. And uh, finally, I would like to talk a little bit about how the final devices look like, but probably you already know from many pictures. So this is fabricated in CMOS um, at wafer level. Uh, what we do at IMEC is after uh, processing this in a commercially uh, CMOS technology, uh, in our fab, then we fabricate the devices uh, by doing uh, etching to create the shapes and also to deposit the electrodes and do the whole packaging as well. These are differences between the two probes. Uh, so basically uh, what we wanted to do to, with 2.0, as mentioned before, was to achieve the same number of channels a similar electrical performance, but in a much smaller form factor. So here the base is around three times smaller. Uh, there is, as Mateo mentioned, there is also a multi-shank version of uh, 2.0. So we have actually two versions available, single shank and a uh, multi-shank. And here are some details of the device. So one of the characteristics of neural pixels probe is that we uh, managed to develop a very uh, low impedance electrode material that is also very stable. So when you have a thousand electrodes in the shank, actually the performance of those electrodes, their uh, characteristics uh, are very uniform. And that was very important also to guarantee that the signal quality that you record uh, is very good. And uh, finally, uh, just one note on the system. So the system is composed of several pieces. One is the probe uh, that is packaged on this flexible PCB. Uh, that flexible PCB connects to one head stage um, that is also very small and lightweight. In 2.0, we have a different head stage that also support two probes at the same time. So that also makes uh, 2.0 uh, very interested in interesting in with respect to the number of channels that you can record at the same time. 
Uh, this connects then uh, to a PXI card uh, that uh, can support also multiple of these probes connected and also the PXI chassis can uh, support several of these acquisition modules. So uh, for details on the system, you have the user manual in the website, and there's also a paper uh, that also was published to report all the details of how the system was envisioned and the architecture and how the scalability was uh, foreseen from the beginning. So I think this is everything from my side. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'm happy to reply questions if there are some.